So I am Tom Fiella, and I am the Executive Director of La Crosse Area Planning Committee, which is a transportation planning organization here in La Crosse. And we are one of the partners with the Minnesota Department of Transportation, the Wisconsin Department of Transportation, the Illinois Department of Transportation, Ramsey County, and all of the cities up and down the river between here and uh, the Twin Cities. We all want to get another train on the track. Um, I want to introduce Pravina Pitaparti, who is the project manager for this project. She is from uh, Minnesota Department of Transportation. And so when did this project start? Um, back in 2012, Minnesota DOT and Wisconsin DOT, we requested Amtrak to conduct a feasibility study for adding a second frequency along the Empire Builder Route. And Amtrak does these studies for states um, to see uh, what, to see or to check the feasibility of adding um, a second train or additional service on their long distance corridors. So in 2015, Amtrak put out the feasibility report which indicated favorable ridership for the second train. We had about 150, uh, 155,000 approximately annually of ridership projections on this corridor and we um, and the study reported um, a revenue of 6.8 million dollars so based on the findings from this study we went ahead and the state DOTs recommended that we start looking at uh, the next step or the next study uh, to um, add a second train <coughs> between Union Station in Chicago and Union Depot in St. Paul. We had looked at several other termini in Minnesota, including Minneapolis, St. Cloud, and so on, but based on the feasibility study findings, it was much better because of lower capital costs and less complex rail operations, we found this alternative to be the most feasible to carry into phase one study the service between Union Depot in Chicago, um, Union Station in Chicago, and Union Depot in St. Paul. So based on that recommendations, we, um, this is uh, the route map. It's basically the Empire Builder route, and it stops at all of the stations that Empire Builder stops <coughs> at, and uh, the General Mitchell International <coughs> Airport, uh, just south of Milwaukee. We will be looking at um, a schedule that is four to six hours <coughs> apart from the existing Empire Builder route. Uh, there are up to 13 stations on the second train uh, corridor. And uh, we will be utilizing um, a slot um, of one of the Hiawatha corridor uh, trains between Chicago and Milwaukee. So what it means is that the second train will be an extension of one of the Hiawatha trains that currently operate between Chicago and Milwaukee. This is uh, because it lessens the impact. We don't have to build anything between Chicago and Milwaukee, and it also lessens the infrastructure improvements uh, between uh, St. Paul and, Mil uh, and Milwaukee. We are looking at a service of 79 miles per hour, the maximum speeds of the service, and then we will be determining the infrastructure improvements needed to operate that second train. The big bugaboo here, if you look at that schedule 2022, there should be big asterisks behind there because of getting the funding from all these different partners to make this happen is very complex. Uh, we haven't determined what the cost share would be. Illinois and Wisconsin are paying for the improvements to Hiawatha. So we're really focused on the segment between Milwaukee and St. Paul, and that would be a Minnesota-Wisconsin cost sharing. But we don't have right now politically a regional model for how we do the cost sharing, how we buy equipment, who owns the equipment, who even we contract with. It may or may not be Amtrak. So there's a lot of those questions yet. We need to get the general concept down, get the general cost estimates, and then share the cost uh, with the funding potential funding partners. The other thing is the, the constantly evolving federal railroad uh, program uh, based on what 
the administration has said now they were looking at eliminating the, the Empire Builder type service, mm -hmm. but shifting those funds to corridor trains such as this. So there's so many things moving right now in terms of the funding. It's very complex. So uh, right now we're looking at do we do we split the cost by mile? Do we split the cost by uh, usage riders? Riders. Uh, there's all sorts of different ways of looking at how that's done, and that's where we're at too. That's the other part of the study that will be coming up with part of the service development plan is making the business case for this to happen and then pursue. The plan. when we were doing the feasibility study, there was huge <coughs> traffic on this corridor from the oil trains. Now it has gone down uh, substantially, but there is still some congestion. So we have to look at the current conditions on the track to determine whether uh, or what improvements are needed to operate the additional train. So based on that operations analysis, we will be doing uh, conceptual engineering and developing some preliminary cost estimates to determine how much the second train would cost. The purpose cost and needs statement is really the foundation of why this project is happening, why we're moving forward with this kind of project. And it forms the basis for all the future analysis <coughs> that's going to happen on this project. You, you bring it back to this purpose and the problems that this project is, is aiming to resolve and compare it so that you know that you're getting the best outcome here. So really the purpose is um, filling gaps in the transportation system. Um, it's developing something that's cost effective both to build it as well as operate it. So we're not, um, another one is integrating with the Hiawatha service, very successful between Milwaukee and Chicago. So supplementing that and integrating with that and then avoiding any delays. You know, the Empire Builder currently is, you know, from Portland and Seattle to Chicago. A lot can happen over that long period of time that can result in delays. If you take a, a smaller segment of that, you know, the intention is that you would cut down on things that are, have no control west of St. Paul so that you don't have, you know, you don't get there and there's whatever it may be. So those are, you know, really why we're, why this project has, has come to where it is today. Well, I think uh, one of the results here is the uh, corridor need, uh, connecting these communities that don't have airline service or limited bus service and are relying on the car to move around. Uh, we know that 25% of the riders uh, from St. Paul to Chicago uh, or excuse me, 25% of the Empire Builder riders get off or on between St. Paul and Chicago. That's a tremendous amount of number of people here that are using it for those shorter trips. It's not necessarily connecting the endpoints, but it's connecting people all along there to goods and services and, and the products. The needs are really the problems that you're trying to solve. Um, and, you know, it's kind of tied to what I just talked about. But, you know, capacity, and I've been talking to folks tonight, you know, in the summer, on the weekends, um, the Empire Builder reaches um, capacity or near capacity. So it's giving you that second schedule, that more, more capacity. Um, the other piece that Praveena mentioned is the alternatives analysis. So what this is showing you is it's going back in time. It's looking at all of the different alternatives that were reviewed. This is a federal requirement because this project would um, would be intended to receive federal funding, you have to really look at all kinds of different options <coughs> of how to get to where you want to go and how to meet that purpose and need. Um, so, you know, here you can, we look, we took work that had already been done. So this area, this quarter has been studied for quite some time. But you can see, you know, about a dozen alternatives were looked at. And then three different alternatives between Milwaukee and Chicago were looked at to bring us to where we are today, which is, using the current existing Empire Builder route. So that's just kind of some background, really, is what this is. Then this one is the, so you have the route, and then you have the service itself. Um, what we did is, uh, once you have your purpose and your need statement, you've, you've looked at your routes, we then, you know, went through a screening process 
to screen out um, alternatives that you know don't make a lot of sense. And really, the the bottom line of this one is, um, I think, yeah, it's shown here. We took these five alternatives. One is no build, means don't do anything, just keep it how it is, and that doesn't meet our purpose because it doesn't help with any of those problems <coughs> that we talked about. Um, the next one, and this is cutting to the chase, <laughs> the recommended alternative here is that the TCMC, our second train service, operates as an extension of that Hiawatha, so it would link in in Milwaukee to one of the existing um, daily Hiawatha routes, so it would be a second service to what's currently there. We did look at other ones <coughs> where it operates um, as an extension of there's proposed Hiawatha, additional proposed three additional round trips that it would link on to one of those three additional round trips. That was something we looked at. We also said what if we operate it individually um, and then between um, um, St. Paul and Milwaukee and then connect it, you know, so would that be? What really happened there is you have a lot of issues with that connection, coupling, and decoupling, and you know, schedule and crew, and it's just expensive. right. It's expensive, but you know, we went through the process to see if that would work. And then the other one is, would it be like an eighth round trip? So again, your things are very consistent between St. Paul and Milwaukee. It's this um, Milwaukee to Chicago. Would it be one additional round trip? So we kind of looked through all of this, and what we really came down to. Um, is stick with what's there and utilize what we have to be cost effective to um, lessen the, the initial upfront costs as well as crew changes and equipment and all of these different things that were analyzed. So we have gone through that process. Well, it's the issue of the funding. We would be a year or two ahead of where we're projecting we'll be if we had a stable, consistent funding source. We have the technical ability to determine what the needs are. We have a great relationship with the host railroad. We have the ear of the federal regulators in doing this project, but getting a consistent, stable funding source is the most frustrating part. How do you project Minnesota will do on their, on their end of the bargain? Well, we put in an annual request for capital funding to uh, target the next phase of work for this study and the next phase of work for the, the Duluth Corridor study. And, uh, in the current environment in the legislature right now is not very supportive or inclined to be on putting money towards this program. And we uh, have to wait till the political winds change or there's some crisis in some other way that uh, drives people to rail. Uh, it's not a matter of people not appreciating it or needing it. It's a, pe a, a, a more of an issue of what people's priorities are. And with limited resources and all of their programs, I understand that. My job is to try to build a transportation network option to driving or flying. I'm pleased that uh, the capital costs for implementing the additional service seem relatively reasonable compared to some other projects that I've heard about or that I've been working on around the country. Uh, it is. Um, uh, it's great to have a freight railroad partner uh, that is willing to work with us to improve the uh, passenger rail uh, service and capacity here uh, in the region. Uh, and so that's been uh, a, a pleasure. Uh, it's also great to see the turnout. Uh, I don't think that uh, the planners of the meeting tonight were expecting as many people to show up as, the, as did. So that's, that shows the high level of interest that exists among the public. Uh, in uh, bringing about this additional service. Really, where we are now is we're taking that, you know, that route and that service and we're putting it through this operations modeling that Praveena mentioned. What that does is it models the existing freight traffic that's out there. I mean, this track is owned by the majority, owned by Canadian Pacific, and they, you know, use it a lot, and it's their business. So it takes their current trains as well as projected growth 
it adds in the existing Empire Builder, and then it adds in this additional frequency so that you can see where um, the traffic, it, where the congestion points are, where there's interference, and it goes through this whole modeling to, so that we know where we might have to put a second track or add a switch or something like that so that you can add that second train and not interfere with Canadian Pacific's current activities and, and business. So that's, that's ongoing. Also what that, what that does is this is, a, this is proposed, so this is just one option, but this is that you know four to six hour difference in schedule that Praveena mentioned. This is more along the four hour. So this would just give you an idea of a proposed schedule and that's what we use in that modeling. So then we can see if you add a train on this schedule, where does it conflict with, you know, Canadian Pacific operating and, um, you know, things like that. So, you know, this, this again isn't the part that's completed yet, but it just gives you an idea of what a schedule would look like. <coughs> so, Nani, can you go through the time sum the schedule? Sure. And to right. The so, um, currently, going westbound, mm -hmm. it would leave about four hours earlier than the existing schedule. I, I think that's about right. And you shave about a half an hour off, so it's about seven and a half hours from end to end. Um, so then going eastbound, I think it's about three and a half hours later leaving St. Paul. So, you know, and then again, you're still at about seven and a half hours instead of eight hours. So everything shifts in this example about four hours um, to give that second option. So you're current Empire Builder stays the same, still is going, and this is just that second frequency. All right, so that modeling that we're doing, this is an example, you know, that schedule that we just showed, it, it kind of shows where these congestion points are and what would need to happen. Again, we're trying to do something that's cost effective here, um, you know, and to both to implement and to, and to ride. So um, this kind of gets a little bit technical, and we have boards of this out there, but it talks about things like um, extending the siding so that you have a, a longer area where the freight can pass or, you know, so that you just, you're making it longer, you're not adding a whole new track. Or um, upgrading siding so that you can keep that operational speed. Um, things like um, upgrading the bridge switch here converting the yard track to main track. So again, taking the, the, the siding, if you will, and making that main track so that you essentially are double tracked throughout. So these are just some ideas of the things that we're looking at um, really centered around improving the existing track, double tracking in places, utilizing siding or siding that was there maybe needs to be replaced, upgraded, things like that. Present right now. Okay. Oh. Um, my my question relates to schedule. Um, I, I this is a very Twin Cities friendly schedule, but it doesn't solve my problem. Um, most people go to Chicago to connect to going to somewhere else. People fly to Chicago to connect to other planes. When I ride the Amtrak to Chicago, it's to connect to another train. When the Empire Builder arrives in Chicago, the Southwest Chief. The Texas Eagle, the California Zephyr, so all the westbound trains have already left hours before. Coming back the other way on those trains, the Empire Builder is long gone by the time we get to Chicago. So we're forced to spend an overnight in Chicago each way when we want to go someplace west. Getting to this schedule was a big challenge. We had many restrictions and the, the biggest restriction was to tie into the existing Hiawatha trains. Uh, because adding uh, an additional, a separate train from all the way to Chicago to St. Paul would have required even more infrastructure improvements. But there are Hiawatha trains that leave early and arrive late. Yes, yeah, so we can look into that. We'll take down your comment, and we understand that, but getting to this itself was a challenge. We looked at a few schedules. But this was the schedule that we came up with, which had the least infrastructure improvement costs. So it was kind of playing a balancing act with the costs as well. 
up to, you know, to operate the train. The fact that we still have another two years of study left and then that we're not going to really be able to get anything going until 2020 and we have to depend on political support to get the operating revenue in place is, is challenging and uh, I'll be the first to admit it. So um, just to um, lead into the next steps, uh, what Nani has presented to you is all the analysis that we have been doing so far. Uh, adding a second train sounds easy. Uh, we have the support, we have the ridership. Let's not uh, let's put it out on on the tracks. But obviously, we need to do all of these analysis to show that we the the train is needed, and what are the issues to actually put it on the tracks, and all of the requirements that we have to follow too uh, to meet federal and state requirements. And uh, as we move on to phase two, we will be looking at environmental analysis also. So this kind of shows what um, what needs to be done to get to the stage even. So phase one, the, we are currently under going through phase one right now. Uh, hopefully we'll complete it this fall. Uh, we'll be in the next couple of months here, we'll be completing conceptual design plans for the proposed infrastructure improvements that you saw in the previous map. Uh, we will develop capital cost <laughs> estimates for those proposed infrastructure improvements so we would have a fair idea of what is needed in terms of capital costs for the additional service. And then the equipment costs are, um, are in addition to that as well. So we need to work out those costs. And what are the cost sharing between the two states? So this will uh, lay the foundation to, for us to move into phase two where we would actually start getting environmental analysis, get that started, and get approval from the Federal Railroad Administration for the additional service. And then, as required by FRA, we will also need to do a service development plan, uh, which basically outlines what the service is, what the schedule is, and what is needed to um, operate the second train. So once we complete phase two, uh, we still have to identify funding for phase two. So we are looking for that, uh, any opportunities <coughs> for phase two. And then after phase two, we will move into final design, uh, construction, and um, operation. So we are looking at potential service could begin uh, by year 2022, depending on um, funding availability. as opposed to the Empire Builder type equipment, the, the single level coaches? Yeah, I, I think it's the Hiawatha type equipment, but we still have to figure out the equipment at this point. Mm -hmm. We haven't gotten to that stage yet. Okay. Yeah. And this would require, what, two additional train sets? Yes. Okay. As I have learned in my years working in public transit, uh, both on the freight railroad side, in the transit industry, and in passenger rail, uh, trying to pinpoint a year is very difficult. I don't bind myself. I don't get all wrapped up in what the target year is. It's I just want to see progress, continual progress uh, in moving the project forward. Uh, I leave that to others to actually sort of tag a year. Uh, I find that I get disappointed if I uh, zero in on some year because inev invariably the stuff gets ends up taking yeah, longer. I'm really encouraged with the support we saw today. We'll see tomorrow in St. Paul. Uh, support we see along the corridor in general and just riding with folks, riding the builder and seeing the variety of folks that use it and depend on it uh, is really uh, heartening. On behalf of the city, I want to again thank you for being here. We really are looking forward to the presentations, your input, questions and dialogue. And unfortunately, I shouldn't say it this way.
generally the empire builder through lacrosse is the highest in the United States on the whole Amtrak system. What about your message tonight with Amtrak for the community members and people from around the state who might come out to me? Uh, our message at Amtrak is that we have been a happy, I mean, we've been pleased to provide passenger rail service to the La Crosse area uh, since 1971. Uh, we will remain and we look forward to and have been working with Wisconsin DOT and Minnesota DOT on the feasibility of adding a second.